was a long program today. Balance it out. <laughs> All right, so thanks to uh, my colleagues, Council Members Germani Williams, Lander, Rose, Julie Zapatera Copeland, uh, our Majority Leader Van Bramer, SPNN, Kozlowitz, and Corey Johnson. Thank you all. Um, so the Council will begin today by voting on multiple land use items. The Morningside Heights Historic District, consisting of approximately 115 buildings of various architectural styles in Upper Manhattan, and the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, the largest Anglican church in the world and seat of the Episcopal Diocese of New York, will both receive a vote to determine the designation, uh, to, uh, designation of landmark status. District 7 Councilmember Mark Levine was unable to join us, but we congratulate him on this historic achievement for his district. The council will also vote on public sightings for two locations in order to facilitate the development of additional public school space for Brooklyn and Staten Island. 357 Targi Street, I hope I got it right, uh, in Council Member Debbie Rose's district will receive a vote, as will the intersection of Atlantic Avenue and Chestnut Street in the district of Council Member Rafael Espinal. I invite each of them to speak on these acquisitions. We can start with Council Member Rose. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm excited. Alleviating school overcrowding in my district has been my top priority. And while we've been made much progress in recent years, some schools remain overcrowded, like PS65, which is at 133% over capacity. PS13 is at 154% over capacity. And PS78 is at 156% over capacity. So over capacity, overcrowding, not only puts a strain on teachers, but it makes it more difficult for students to con concentrate on their lessons. It limits innovation in the classroom and ultimately leads to lower test scores. So today, at today's stated meeting, we will take a significant step forward, alleviating overcrowding and ensuring quality educational facilities for children on the North Shore of Staten Island. By authorizing the purchase of the land at 357 Targi Street. I've been working for months with the School Construction Authority and the Department of Education to identify an appropriate location that would best meet the needs of families in my district. And together we found 357 Tar G Street in Stapleton, an ideal location for a new state-of-the-art school, complete with science lab, performing arts spaces, exercise rooms, cafeteria, and more, including classroom space for more than 800 students. Last fall and last winter, we hosted a public review process and the response from my communities was overwhelming. I look forward to today's city council vote authorizing the purchase of this property so that I can take this process forward and ensure quality educational opportunities for North Shore families for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm really excited to be here today and actually have the opportunity to vote on a commitment that the mayor uh, has made through the East New York rezoning process, and that is to bring a thousand seat school uh, to the students of East New York. You know, this thousand seat school will be uh, state of the art. It will have all of the uh, uh, amenities that a lot of the schools have across the city. But there's one thing that I really pushed for, and that's to make sure that it had a green roof. Uh, so we're going to see one of the largest and one of the uh, most state of the art green roofs. In this building, you know, I believe that urban gardening is the way of the future, and I'm proud to say the East New York students and Cypress Hill students will have that opportunity. Uh, besides that, this school also will help deal with this severe overcrowding that's been going on in the neighborhood for decades, uh, help alleviate some of the issues that we've seen in neighboring schools, while also making room for new residents that are coming in uh, thanks to the rezoning. So I'm very proud of the work that we were able to do, and I'm very proud of the um, of the commitments that the the mayor has been very has been able to. Um, to deliver on, and I want to thank the council and the speaker for supporting this project as well. Thank you. Thank you. We've been joined by Council Members Richards and uh, Salamanca, who will be speaking next, actually. Last up for land use, the council will vote on a zoning map change and a zone text amendment for 600 East 156th Street in the Bronx. This rezoning will allow for the addition of public parking spaces serving a mixed use development featuring a 450 seat charter school and a 175 units 
and 175 units of 100% affordable housing. Again, this is in Council Member Salamanca's district, and he'll say a few words. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, today, I'm pleased to join uh, the speaker and encourage my colleagues to vote in favor of two land use items that will work to create affordable housing in the Melrose neighborhood and my district. Uh, the project uh, will stem from rezoning in one of the land use one of the land use teams, and I have worked diligently and have carefully negotiated to ensure that it fits the needs of my community. Uh, this was not an easy process, but I'm pleased to say that today I feel incredibly confident that these uh, land use actions won't just lead to new affordable housing in the South Bronx, but new affordable housing for the South Bronx. So specifically as a result of our negotiations, additional units have been set aside for families making 30% of a, a AMI or less. Additionally, a new community school will be provided space below the new housing. And finally, this building will be staffed by workers being paid fair wages with good benefits. With that said, I'm pleased to say that since taking office in March of 2016, 14 months as we speak today, I have worked to secure and create 3,512 affordable apartments for our district and look forward to continuing to work to ensure all residents of our community have access to quality housing right here in their own neighborhoods. Next, the council will vote to co-name 53 streets and thoroughfares throughout the city. Among the locations receiving co-namings are the 85th Street Central Park Transverse, which will be co-named for Detective Stephen McDonald, who was paralyzed in the line of duty in 1986 and passed away earlier this year. Metropolitan Avenue and St. Raymond's Avenue in the Bronx, co-named for deceased NYPD Sergeant Paul J. Tuzulo. East 7th Street and 2nd Avenue in Manhattan, which will be co-named for Moises Locon and Nicolas Figueroa, both victims of the 2015 East Village gas explosion, and a location that is still to be determined in the Bronx for EMT Yadira Arroyo, who recently lost her life in the line of duty. This is one of the many ways that the city works to commemorate lost residents who made substantive contributions to their communities and I'm honored that the council will be recognizing them today. Guys, can you please just keep it tight? On our legislative docket, introduction 1627A, sponsored by council member Eric Ulrich, would permanently change the name of the 163rd Street, uh, one, I'm sorry, 163rd Avenue Pedestrian Bridge in Queens to the Joel A. Meal St. P uh, Street Pedestrian Bridge. He is not here with us today. Uh, council, well, he's here, not here at this meeting, but he will be upstairs voting on this item later on. Introduction 1305A, sponsored by Council Member Rafael Salamanca, would require the Department of Parks and Recreation to post notices of the effective date of temporary parking restrictions relating to tree removals at least two days before the commencement of such restrictions. Council Member Salamanca. Thank you. Uh, so today I'm pleased that we're voting on intro 1305 which will require the Department of Parks and Recreation to post notices of the effective date of temporary parking restrictions relating to the tree rem removals at least two days before the commencement of such restrictions with certain expectations. This legislation was a community-driven effort aiming to provide a simple fix to an issue that can affect all of us in our daily lives. Simply, this bill says that not less than two days prior to the commencement of temporary parking restrictions on any street or roadway, for the purpose of removal of trees by the department, the department shall post notice of the effective date of such rest restrictions on such street or roadway, unless the planned work is to occur in accordance with other existing parking restrictions, such as uh, alternate side parking uh, regulations. Such notification shall include the effective date of such restrictions, the location of such restrictions, and the estimated end date of such restrictions. The department will also be tasked with notifying the community boards where said work is occurring. An expectation is made in the bill, and I'm sorry, an exception is made in the bill to allow the department to act when it is immediately necessary to preserve public safety. With that said, I encourage the speaker and my colleagues to join me in the support of this bill today, ensuring that, a communi that, ensuring that the community gets ample notice of when off-street parking will be affected by tree maintenance simply makes sense, and I'm proud that we're voting on my bill today that does just that. Thank you, Council Member. Intro 848, sponsored by Council Member Richie Torres, would require the Campaign Finance Board to include a copy of each voter's voting history for the prior four years alongside the quadriennially issued voter guide. 
Council Member Torres is unable to join us today, but we thank him for this important measure. Next, we're also voting on intro 951A, sponsored by Council Member Elizabeth Crowley, which would require existing multi-line telephone systems in certain businesses and city agencies to have direct telephone access to 911, such that a prefix is not required prior to dialing, to, to, to dialing uh, by May 1st of 2019. Thank, we thank Council Member Crowley um, for this measure. She uh, is not with us at this moment. Although we are moving into the warmer months, Introduction 722A, sponsored by Housing and Buildings Committee Chair Jamani Williams, looks to increase the minimum nighttime temperature that residential building owners are required to provide tenants during heating season from 55 degrees to 62 degrees, regardless of outdoor temperature. With that, we can ask Council Member Williams to say a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is obviously the most exciting thing we could be doing as we're going into summer. Um, but uh, we, did, we were hoping to have this done before actually this past heating season. Uh, we wanted to make sure it happened before this season uh, coming up, which is why we're doing it now, making it a little less newsworthy, but hopefully folks will cover it anyway because I think it very much is important. I want to thank uh, the speaker for uh, helping shepherd this through as well. As was mentioned, we're changing the minimum nighttime temperature uh, to 62 degrees between October 1st and May 31st, regardless of the outside temperature. I want to uh, also just uh, shout out and thank Borough President Gail Brewer, who had this bill before me uh, when she was in the council and was a co-sponsor with me. It will be effective October 1st, 2017. Sufficient heat is a quality of, of life that can't be ignored in larger conversation of tenants' rights, uh, especially uh, our elderly and our young infants and people who are sick already. Uh, I don't think people understand or imagine what it feels like to be in 55 degrees, uh, particularly in the winter months. That's just extremely too low for inside. And on top of that, the current law said uh, outdoor temperatures have to be 40 degrees to require a landlord to even turn on the heat and making it at 55 degrees. Uh, that was terrible. Um, uh, as a community, when I was doing tenant organizing, we'd often run into people who think they didn't, that the landlord wasn't uh, following the law, but they didn't realize how cold they were allowed to be. Uh, in addition, as HPD inspectors uh, testified to, uh, that it causes confusion because sometimes uh, they will come outside and test and it might be 41 degrees, it might be 42, it might be 39, and so that outside temperature causes mass confusion. Uh, we took it away and uh, we decided there is a temperature that makes sense. Uh, it's 62 degrees. Uh, the environmental impact hasn't been shown to be uh, that major, and we want to make sure people uh, have a good comfort of life, and I think this was a great, uh, a great way to come up a compromise to what we were trying to do. Uh, so we want to thank the administration as well, all of my colleagues. There are additional thank yous that I'll do on the floor. Thank you. Of our two major legislative packages being voted on today, the first seeks to reform the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals through the implementation of a series of oversight measures and operational improvements. In the interest of time, I'm going to let each member elaborate on the specifics of their bills, beginning with Introduction 288A, sponsored by Majority Leader Jimmy Van Bramer. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I just want to say uh, I'm proud to be a member of the City Council uh, every day, but today is an amazing day with the uh, fair work week package and, and so many other bills that are so important and I'm proud of uh, this one as well. So the Board of Standards and Appeals uh, has a lot of uh, decision making authority over our neighborhoods and uh, too often uh, when communities, elected officials and community boards raise their voices in opposition to uh, Board of Standards and Appeals uh, application, uh, those voices are not heard and when those voices are not listened to, uh, the Board of Standards and Appeals uh, never uh, tells us why and how they came to those decisions, making communities feel that whatever they say uh, matters not, and uh, we need to reform that. We need to make sure there's more power in the hands of community members and community boards and elected officials uh, when it comes time to what our neighborhood is going <coughs> to look like and how it's going to appear. So this bill uh, uh, changes that, uh, creates a layer of transparency and accountability uh, and reporting uh, when the board uh, does not uh, listen to communities, community members, uh, community boards and elected <laughs> officials and requires uh, that they uh, reference and address those concerns and dissent from the public, community boards and elected officials in their final decisions, uh, giving us the power to strike back and fight back. So I'm uh, proud to be a part of uh, this package, uh, proud of this 
particular piece of legislation and proud to be a member of this city council. All right, intro 418A is co sponsored by council member Karen Kozlowitz. Thank you. Community and borough boards spent significant time and effort on special permit applications brought before them for review. Public hearings, community outreach, special committees, and full board review are common when considering special permits. Community and borough boards should not feel that their recommendation on a matter was overlooked, discarded by the BSA. Intro 418 would require the Board of Standards and Appeals in granting or denying an application before them to respond to any relevant recommendation filed by a community or borough board regarding such an application. Thank you, Council Member. Introduction 514A, sponsored by Minority Leader Steve Mario, who was unable to be with us today, would require that for any term, I'm sorry, for any term variance granted by the BSA after December 31st, 2013, the board shall notify the owner of the property of the expiration of the variance six months in advance. Next, we're gonna hear from Zoning and Franchises Subcommittee Chair Donovan Richards on intro 1200A. Thank you, Speaker. I'm proud to stand here today to ensure that the Board of Standard and Appeals with a capital BS uh, does its fair share of accountability uh, <laughs> uh, when it uh, uh, <laughs> does its fair share of accountability when it comes to developers notifying communities and elected officials about applications in their neighborhoods. Intro 1200A will require developers to send applications to council members, borough presidents, and community boards by certified mail or any method that provides proof of service. The BSA is then required to post on its website the proof of delivery was received and verified. It was so shocking to hear that the BSA does not track these instances where developers do not follow through on this required step in the process. Whether these developers are trying to sneak by this important notification or were just sloppy, let's imagine. This requirement will require and ensure that the BSA is working with communities and elected officials and not against us. I'd like to thank the speaker, uh, Chair Kalos the gov of the Governmental Operations Committee, and Brad Reed, and my legislative director, Jordan Gooding. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. The last five bills in the package were sponsored by Governmental Ops Chair Ben Kalos, who was unfortunately unable to join us today, but is exceptionally proud of the work done by his committee to develop this package. Uh, his bills include intro 1390A, 1391A, 1392A, 1393A, and uh, intro 1394A, which deal in enhancing standards for the staffing of the BSA and the materials required when submitting and reviewing applications, in addition to allowing for the creation of a mapped and publicly accessible database of variants and special permit applications. Next, the Council will vote on introduction 1456A, Sponsored by Council Member Karen Kozlowitz, which would require food carts and trucks to post a letter grade that is based on their most recent health inspection by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Council Member Kozlowitz. Thank you to the speaker. I cannot imagine someone not looking for a restaurant's letter grade from our city's health department be before deciding whether or not to patronize a restaurant. The A, B, C, or grade pending carries with it real significance. The letter grade has become absolutely essential as it relates to restaurants. Yet, every day, countless numbers of people in New York are expected to purchase food from a street vendor without knowing, general, to a general degree, the cart com compliance with the New York City Health Code. The customers who buy food from a street vendor deserve to have the same ability to make an informed decision as patrons of restaurants. Intro 1456 would mandate that the health department expand letter grading to street food vendors and that it should mirror the restaurant grading system as closely as possible. And I can say when that happens, I can't imagine 
not stopping for a hot dog at a food bank. <laughs> <laughs> I also, <laughs> I also want to thank uh, the Health Committee, Corey Johnson, for hearing this bill. I want to thank the Speaker for supporting the bill, and I want to thank everyone. I cannot wait for this bill to take effect. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, now our final legislation, known as the Fair Work Week Package, looks to regulate ongoing issues with employment practices in the fast food and retail industries. With these bills, we aim to establish a national model for protecting workers' rights, and I am proud of this council for bringing the fight for workplace considerations home to New York City. Similar to the BSA package, I will let the members go into the details of their legislation, starting with intro 1384, sponsored by Finance Chair Julissa Ferreras Copeland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at a time when the president and federal government continue to put protections previously available to low-wage workers, working families and communities of color, women and children um, on the line, it is vital for workers to have the ability to make voluntary contributions to a nonprofit that can advocate for their needs. I am proud to sponsor intro 1384, the Fast Food Worker Empowerment Bill. This first of its kind legislation will allow fast food workers to gather their financial resources and focus on issues that are important to them. Enforce penalties and remedies for violation in employers who break the rules and protect workers against retaliation from their employers. Um, I want to thank uh, the co-sponsors of this bill, but also the amazing work of the speaker staff and Matt <coughs> Goab and I had many conversations till late, late at night and also the administration side and the speaker for shepherding this through. We did this together, um, so I also have to pu publicly acknowledge uh, Council Member Lander, Council Member Johnson, and just all of us as a team. Uh, it wasn't easy, but we're glad that we're here today. Yes. Thank you. Introductions 1387A and 1388A, sponsored by Council Member Corey Johnson. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, for giving me this opportunity to discuss my two bills, 1387 and 1388 which we look forward to passing today in the council. This legislation protects workers from predatory scheduling practices that take advantage of the employee with no regard to their personal or financial needs. Introduction 1387 bans the use of on-call scheduling for retail employees requiring employers to provide 76 hours notice before changing, adding, or removing shifts. This common sense measure asks employers to show their workers some basic decency we ask from people on all aspects of our lives to give some warning before making changes that drastically affect us. For single parents, a day or two isn't always enough time to find or cancel a babysitter. For those with more than one job, as many of the hardworking individuals who this legislation will affect, one or two days isn't enough to ch change their schedule to accommodate an additional shift. If more than two days notice isn't too much to ask for an employee, it certainly isn't too much to ask for from an employer. Secondly, introduction 1388 would ban fast food establishments from scheduling their employees to clopen, work back-to-back -back shifts, uh, the first to close the restaurant and the second person to open it in the morning. Uh, the pr like the previous bill, 1388 asks employers to show their workers a basic level of respect by letting them rest. This opportunity to tuck your child in for the night and get them ready for school should not be sacrificed in order to sleep more than a few hours between your shifts. I wanted to uh, acknowledge Council Member Ferris Copeland, who I think left, uh, the speaker who has worked on this for a very long time, and it's a really proud day here in the council. And I also want to uh, give him his due because this has been, uh, I think, a package that he has really championed and worked really hard on. Uh, council Member Lander has worked very hard. I want to thank 32BJ and RWDSU and all of the staff that worked on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member, and finally, uh, intros 1395A and 1396A, sponsored by Council Member Brad Lander. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is a, a really great day in the Council. Almost five years ago, uh, a small group of fast food workers went on strike in, uh, outside a fast food restaurant in downtown Brooklyn and sparked a national movement. It has spread across the country around the simple idea uh, that fast food workers ought to have dignity and rights on their job, and that instead of seeing them as low-wage shift workers, uh, not able to put a life together, uh, that they have rights, that they've got dignity, that they can organize together. 
thanks to what they started, uh, the Fight for 15 swept across the country. They won $15 an hour here and helped nearly 10 million workers across the country on the path to $15 an hour. Unfortunately, uh, 15 bucks an hour is great, but if you don't have enough hours that you're working, it still doesn't help you pay your rent or put food on your table or send your kids to school. And if you don't know your schedule and you can't figure out how to organize childcare or school or just put a stable life together, that 15 bucks isn't doing you much good. So what we are doing today uh, is truly powerful. The whole package gets it done together, and I really appreciate uh, what Council Members Ferris Copeland and Johnson said. Uh, the two bills that I'm sponsoring, intro 1396A, requires that fast food employers provide two weeks advance notice of their schedule to all workers in fast food restaurants, all shift workers. Um, and if it's changed, if the schedule is changed after that, there's a schedule change premium that those workers have to get. More if shifts are canceled than added, and more as the date of cancellation gets closer to the shift um, in a way that guarantees that those, uh, that those schedules will be real. And intro 1395A gives fast food workers a path to more hours than if they want them to full-time hours by requiring that before employers post to hire a new employee, that they offer those hours, those shifts, to their existing employees. So you can't get stuck, as so many fast food workers are, in an involuntary part-time job where you can't get enough hours to pay your bills. Because together, 15 bucks an hour, two weeks advance notice, a pathway to a full-time job, and the opportunity to organize with your coworkers, that is a way that fast food workers could still, even in this city, have a stable life. Uh, it has been indeed been a lot of work to get here, so I want to thank the speaker for her steadfast support. I want to thank uh, our legislative director, Matt DeWalb, and his entire team, because this has been a lot of work. Um, I want to thank my legislative uh, director, uh, Annie Levers. I'll thank a few more people on the floor. Um, I want to say once this bill goes into effect and Councilmember Kozlowicz's bill goes into effect, I think we should do a walking tour. and We could get a, a grade A hot dog and maybe even make the first trip in a long time we've made to a fast food restaurant. And, uh, and we'll hopefully take Councilmember Kozlowicz up on her uh, office. And thank you, Councilmember, for your, your strong advocacy and, and definitely to all of the staff. I know Matt has put in countless hours, as the other staff have as well. But thank you for your advocacy. Uh, very quickly in Spanish, and then I'll take questions. El Consejo Municipal votará sobre múltiples reformas de la Junta de Normas y Apelaciones de la Ciudad de Nueva York. También votaremos sobre un paquete legislativo para reformar las prácticas laborales en las industrias de comida rápida y de venta al por menor. Estos seis proyectos de ley ofrecen protecciones en los derechos de los trabajadores y abordan los desafíos que enfrentan los empleados en estas industrias. Adicionalmente, el Consejo votará para establecer el distrito histórico de Morningside Heights y sobre las ubicaciones de nuevas escuelas públicas en Staten Island y Brooklyn. Además, votaremos sobre un proyecto de vivienda asequible en el condado del Bronx. También presentaremos un proyecto para requerir que los vendedores ambulantes de comida muestren al público la calificación que reciben en las inspecciones del Departamento de Salud. Por otra parte, se presentará un proyecto de ley para requerir que la Junta de Finanzas de Campaña incluya una copia de la historia de votación de cada votante para los cuatro años anteriores. Y finalmente, el Consejo votará sobre un proyecto de ley para aumentar la temperatura nocturna mínima en la que se debe dar calefacción en los edificios residenciales de 55 grados a 62 grados. And with that, So I think for the more aggressive requirements, two weeks advance notice, uh, all the requirements in fast food, we thought fast food was a good place to start with those. Those are big corporate chains, national businesses. Uh, they've been covered by this legislation elsewhere. Retail is a much bigger sector, right? You've got small businesses in retail. You've got some local chains. Uh, so what we for retail, we wanted to ban on-call because on-call is a really – um, you know, it's gross to have somebody have to wait around, see whether they're going to get a shift, and if it gets canceled, you're, you're out of luck. So that is more broadly banned. The more aggressive uh, regime of advance notice and access to hours, we are starting with fast food, which is a, you know, a more national and corporate sector. If it works there, perhaps at some future point we'll expand it, but that's the reason for starting.
they have the right to do that. I disagree with the commissioner's statements and his decision to not march. Uh, you know, we're not gonna, we can't relitigate a case that has already been litigated. And uh, again, this individual in, in Oscar is not the only focus of this parade. The history of this parade over 60 years is to honor the contributions, uh, and historic contributions in many fields of the Puerto Rican community. There are many other honorees. Uh, there's a lot of designations. Uh, there's a lot to celebrate. And so for um, individuals to just focus on this one individual um, is unfortunately troubling. Uh, my understanding is is that everything is is legally done. You can have your questions. Those questions you can direct to Councilmember Greenfield. That's my understanding. You have no ethical concerns. That's my understanding. That everything that's been done, you can have your uh, your interpretation of it. But everything that has been done is illegal. Vamos a estar claros de ciertas cosas. Esta campaña de tratar de desprestigiar el desfile está, con, está siendo eh, orquestado por un grupo de ultraderechistas estadistas en Puerto Rico. Esto todo está siendo orquestado por un grupo de la isla. Esto no es algo que surge de aquí, de Nueva York o de ninguna eh, otra ciudad que ha participado en este desfile. Así que eso es importante que se reconozca. Y eh, los patrocinadores tienen el derecho ¿no? de tomar su decisión. Eh, yo apoyo ¿okay? yo apoyo la decisión de la Junta Directiva del desfile puertorriqueño eh, de, de hacer lo que están haciendo, de darle reconocimiento a aquellos que ellos han decidido, le quieren dar reconocimiento, y el desfile sigue. Aunque los patrocinadores posiblemente no tengan una carroza, eh, Todavía están contribuyendo a las becas, por ejemplo, eh, pero esto es un desfile del pueblo y el pueblo va a seguir marchando y el desfile sigue hacia adelante y la gente que se quiera unir, que se una, que sea el pueblo que dicte eh, lo que decide, o sea, lo que vaya a decidir hacer, eso, eso, eso tienen el derecho de hacer, pero no estoy de acuerdo en las decisiones, ¿por qué lo están haciendo? Porque está basado en información incorrecta. Um, that I'm saying that, you know, I think one thing that, that uh, needs to be clear is that a lot of the campaign uh, putting pressure on the sponsors to withdraw, et cetera, is being manipulated and organized and orchestrated from an ultra right wing element on the island. Uh, the statehood party is very much threatened by what this parade represents and what Oscar Lopez Rivera represents. And so at that, now they're engaging and trying to force companies to withdraw uh, and making certain threats uh, if they don't do so. So that's one element of it. Again, as I said, you know, the parade and the, sp the sponsors have the right to make the decisions that they make. Uh, individuals who decide not to march can decide not to march. Uh, they can't base that decision though on, uh, on, on lies or erroneous information or relitigating a case and making up facts that were never part of the original case. And so that's important to really determine. This parade is about celebrating the diversity of our culture, the contributions that we've made as Puerto Ricans. I support the, uh, the board of directors in their decision and people make their individual choices as to whether or not they want to participate. I think that, you know, the, the parade's decision is, based, look, the, the, the campaign to free Oscar was a campaign 35 years in the making. He was in jail almost 36 years, 12 years in solitary confinement. He received broad based support, uh, even coming from this council. Uh, international figures, Nobel laureates, Pope Francis, uh, labor leaders, international and national support from very broad, diverse groups. So that demonstrates, right, what strength his campaign had 
uh, that it was a disproportionate sentence, that he was solely in jail because of his political beliefs, that he was not tied to any act of violence, that he has renounced violence, and to have received two presidential pardons. He did receive one from President Clinton, did not accept it because it was not offered to everyone. Okay, that's the sole reason he did not accept it. Um, and then to have been offered a commutation not by President Obama. Uh, obviously, I would think that a commutation is based on a thorough assessment of the case and whether or not this individual um, will reintegrate successfully into our society. There is a very strong case to be made. Those are the facts. Nothing else that can be said. People would be relitigating the case, and that is completely uh, unfortunate. And that's what people are doing uh, in basing their actions to that march is based on uh, on, on lies. I'm not sure about this last case, the, the lace that you're talking about. Which, I'm sorry, which one? Oh, Alcantara, Alcantara. So, no, I didn't, I didn't hear the name very accurately. I, I'm not even thinking about that this moment in terms of the next election cycle, but clearly I am a Democrat and I believe that the Democratic Conference should be unified. That's my position and I would hope that at some point uh, the members of the IDC would regroup with the Democratic Party and the Democratic Conference. I'm not speaking to election cycles in the future right now. I'm not focused on that at all. Uh, I've seen some, I saw a letter circulated by a large business owner on the island threatening to not renew contracts with uh, corporations that uh, if they continue their sponsorship of the parade, uh, and I have a feeling that that's probably more a widespread, that sentiment and that kind of action. Uh, so this is again a right wing element within the statehood party. Uh, the same day of the parade, for those of you that don't know, there is supposedly a plebiscite happening on the island, uh, a plebiscite in which the statehood party has orchestrated and they wanna see that result at the end of the day. They're trying to rally around their cause by trying to undermine this parade. That is the way I see it. Uh, that is my determination of it. Uh, and they're orchestrating this whole campaign to, to reach that end, to reach the result that they wanna reach, despite the fact that the US Congress and this administration has clearly said that they have no interest in looking at the issue of statehood for Puerto Rico. 